This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, I have a musician on the phone. Actually, yes, a musician, actor, I'm just judging from what I'm reading, all of, he's all over the place in the entertainment industry in terms of what he can do, <laughs> but mainly in the music. I got the wonderfully talented John Welbsley on the phone. How do you do, John? Hey, how you doing, Greg? <laughs> not too bad, not too bad. Yeah, Steve Joyner, uh, of course, uh, connected us. He insisted that I have you on the show, and I looked up your uh, stats, and I was like, yes, this sounds like it'll be an interesting interview. I'm going to take a guess. Right. I'm going to take a guess and say Steve uh, conjured you up on social media like he does a lot of them, huh? Well, actually, uh, we, were, uh, we were connected by an old friend, uh, Stan Livingston. Oh, I, who, inter- I who, interviewed Stan. Who played yeah. Chip Douglas. On- yeah. Uh, th- Great that- guy. Yes, yeah, Stan was a great guy, and, and of course, Stan, it was uh, a long time getting him on, because I remember uh, Steve had mentioned him to me way back in January and told me to connect with him <laughs> after February, and finally got him on in May, but I, I'm, I'm guessing you worked with him in My Three Sons, I'm, I'm judging from your credits. Um, Stan, Stan Livingston, who, uh, who played um, Chip Douglas on My Three Sons. Absolutely. And, uh, I was actually I was actually an actor in a couple of My Three Sons episodes, so I've known Stan and his brother Barry Livingston since gosh, the late sixties. That's gonna make him feel old. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's not not a lot we can do about that. We're all getting older. Yeah, I'm about to turn the big four five uh, next month. So, <laughs> I'll actually, all right, yeah, Good for you, <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, you you've uh, I, I, you mentioned that um, you've been up around this area here. I'm of course in the New Brunswick, Canada area. Yeah, uh, and you've mentioned you've been up in Camp- Campobello. Uh, tell me about your trips up in this this uh, part of Canada. Well, my wife and I did a, a two-month RV trip last okay. summer. It was it was great fun. Um, we live in in southern Maine, and we've we've been in this part of the country for about two years now. And uh, we decided to take the summer off and just RV all through northern New England. And we went up the Maine coast and uh, and visited Campobello, which is a, a wonderful place to go. I'd always heard about it. Um, I didn't even realize that the Roosevelts were actually living in Canada, um, but in in fact it is. So we, we and we rode our bikes across the border, which was which was great. Uh, there's a bridge that goes over uh, to the island, and it's just gorgeous. And from there we went north um, into Quebec and uh, Quebec City, which was our it was our first time there as well. Um, I'd been to Canada quite a few times, um, mostly on tour. Um, first in the 80s, and uh, and then a few years ago, uh, playing with some some British acts in Canada. But um, this was this was my first vacation there in a long time. <laughs> yeah, you've got uh, a tremendous uh, list of people you've worked with. But uh, you know, I, I'm just curious, how how did you get into music? Is that just something that uh, you always uh, prized yourself with growing up? How did you um, step into that? It was something that I always had a fascination with from a very early age. Um, my mother, my, my parents were not particularly musical. My mother's family was. All her aunts and uncles played instruments. This was, you know, many years ago back in England. And uh, as a kid, I was just fascinated with music, um, primarily rock and roll and um and the guitar and from about six that's all i wanted to do was play the guitar and uh i was lucky to have very supportive parents at at about six my parents bought me a a clock radio that would play you know whatever stations you you put on until you fell asleep and then it would shut itself off automatically 
So that's what I did. Every night I went to sleep listening to the local rock and roll station. This was early 60s. So okay. they were playing, you know, a lot of Elvis and Ricky Nelson and stuff like that. And I guess I kind of got my first songwriting training there because I remember listening to new songs on the radio and I would try to guess what the next line, what the, what the rhyming line was going to be. So, um, you know, as an adult, looking back, I thought, well, gosh, you know, that's, that's kind of uh, advanced for a six-year-old, kind of trying to second-guess what the lyricist <laughs> was going to say. Yeah. Did you have any uh, favorite uh, performers? Oh, tons. Tons. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, 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 the ones I remember from back then were Elvis and Ricky Nelson, who at the time was on... Um, the Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. Okay. So I used to watch that uh, because every week he would debut a, a song that he was releasing at the end of the show. It was, it was um, like MTV, but, you know, 20 years before MTV. Um, this was before the Beatles. So back then, you know, there were the, the Four Seasons and, uh, and you know, the, the Letterman and the, um, you know, Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley, and all the, all the early 60s folky stuff. And then um, about two years later um, was when the Beatles hit. Yeah. And, and we had heard about the Beatles from my grandmother in England. Um, and she said, oh, these, these, these four boys are just, they're just lovely and you know, Johnny will love them. So I kind of felt like the Beatles were really mine because I, I felt like I knew about them before everyone else yeah. um, you know, in the States. Yeah. No, um, I've seen pictures of you, of course, with the guitar and whatnot. As, what instruments, what all the instruments do you play, and is guitar your favorite? Guitar is my favorite. It's, it's my first instrument. It's the one that I play the best. It's the one that I've made um, a living playing, you know, all my life. But, you know, along the way, I've, I picked up a lot of different things. Um, I studied the cello and, and the flute in school. Um, you know, I took piano lessons, some piano lessons as a kid. Um, I played drums, I played bass, keyboards, harmonica. I used to used to play the harmonica on the Waltons. In fact, that's, I think, part of the reason I got the part initially. Um, mandolin, you know, I've, I've fooled around with the fiddle, although I wouldn't, I wouldn't call myself a fiddle player. But, you know, I just picked up whatever I needed to along the way, you know, for the recordings that I was making and so on, and, and, and for other work. Um, you know, I always found that as a professional musician, you know, you needed to, to be in 19 different bands. You needed to play a lot of different styles of music, different instruments, and to be able to read music. And that way, you know, you would get the most offers because you, you had the most to offer to different um, people who had, had work. Tell me about your experience working on the Waltons. Well, the Waltons came came along um, a few years into my acting career. Um, after I started playing guitar, I started doing little local amateur shows in Southern California. And uh, at one point, I was seen by some producers and, and invited to audition for a film. So a friend said, oh, well, if you're going to get involved with you know, Hollywood, you have to have an agent. And, and he knew someone. So I got an agent. And I started going out on auditions for TV and, and, and films and commercials. And uh, after doing that for about uh, five years and appearing in, in different shows, um, I got this audition for a, a TV movie called The Homecoming, which was a, a Christmas special. And they wanted a red-haired boy with freckles who played the harmonica. So I went with my harmonica and I read for the part and I played the harmonica at the audition and you know, I got the part. The rest is history. Yes, and uh, uh, you got one film in your... Well, you've done mostly television, but one that kind of caught my attention was uh, Waiting to Act. Tell me about that. Well, that, that was actually, um, you know, after the Waltons and kind of a, kind of a project that I did for some, some friends who were film students at USC, Okay. So, um, you know, they said, would you, would you help us out and, and, uh, and play a role in our film? And, and I did. Is it a feature? 
It was a like I said, it was a student film. It was a it was a short. Oh, okay. But it was you know part of their um, their their um, project for their film school degree there. Well, you've got uh, a lot of musical acts that uh, you've worked with, and I got a bunch of them listed down here uh, uh, to share your experience with. Of course, uh, one notable one, of course, Strawberry Alarm Clock. Clock, of course, which was famous for that song, uh, Incense and Peppermints. Right. <laughs> uh, what was uh, your experience like working with them? It was great. You know, they're a great bunch of guys. They've, they've been around since 1967. And, uh, you know, the current version of the band, I'm, I'm happy to say, is, is just fantastic. They have most of the original members, and they put on a great 60s-themed show. And, you know, even if you don't, if you're not familiar with their other material, because um, Incense was a big hit, but they had a lot of other songs. If, even if you don't know the songs, their live show is such a great 1960s concert experience. You know, they really capture that era and what it was like to go to a live show then. See, you're, you're too young to remember that. I'm, I'm almost too young to remember that. But, um, but, I, but I do remember, um, you know, in the 60s, I saw the Beatles, and my mother, my mother actually took me to see Jimi Hendrix at a festival. I was, I was 13, so oh, I was man. young to go on my own. But my, but my mom, God bless her, you know, took me to, um, to a festival near where we lived, and, and I saw Hendrix. What was that like? Oh, it was fantastic. Just, just it, was, it was the same month that, um, that the Woodstock Festival happened. Oh, wow. So it, it was kind of like you know, a mini version of that, without the, without the rain and mud, fortunately. Oh gee, is he? Is he? I, I I gotta know. I gotta know this. Uh, we all hear a, how, how much of a legend he is on the guitar, but you saw that firsthand. Yes. Yeah, I was I was very lucky that uh, that like I say, I got to see the Beatles. I got to see um, Hendrix. I saw Eric Clapton in his first band after Cream, which was called Blind Faith. That was with uh, Steve Winwood on okay. keyboards and vocals. And, uh, I mean, those were just fantastic shows. Tell me about seeing the, the Beatles. That was um, in San Diego, California, okay. at uh, Balboa Stadium. Uh, it was 1965. Okay. Um, again, the same month that the Beatles played um, at Shea Stadium in New York, which is a very famous concert. Um, that was the biggest, at that time, the biggest rock show that had ever been put on because it was at the stadium and there were 50,000 50, people there. So and this was just a few days later. They flew to the West Coast and they played in L.A. at, I think, um, Dodger Stadium and then down in San Diego at uh, Balboa Stadium, which, is, which was um, a football field. Okay. Well, you've also worked with another group called uh, the Doobie Brothers. <laughs> Yes, a um, long time ago, um, <laughs> I was actually invited to perform at a benefit they were putting on. Um, this was when I was doing the Waltons. Okay. It would be about 1978. Okay. And, and really, just right before they hit the, the very peak of their career, early peak of their career, um, they were doing a benefit for uh, Will Gear's theater. Will Gear played Grandpa on the Waltons, and he'd become friends with them. I'm not, I'm not sure um, where they met exactly, but, um, but you know, he was, Will was a very gregarious fellow, and um, he, he, he was well-connected with a lot of interesting people, and in, in his travels, he became friends with, of all people, the Doobie Brothers. Uh, they decided to do a benefit for his theater, and during the planning stages of that, uh, Will actually passed away. And so the benefit became uh, a benefit for the theater, but also a tribute to his memory. So they went ahead with that, and this was in um, Santa Cruz, California, um, okay. where some of them lived. And uh, it was at a, at a club, a famous club, called The Catalyst. And it was a, you know, a whole bunch of people on the bill, and uh, I actually got up and played, and they, they were my backing band, 
of all things, <laughs> which was just unbelievable. And I, I couldn't believe how great, not only how great they were, but, but you know, how fast. We had a little uh, rehearsal in L.A. before we went up there and just, you know, ran through the songs a couple of times. And I, I couldn't believe how, how fast they picked everything up. It was like instantaneously. So, um, yeah, it was, that was a great thrill. We also recently, very recently, lost Greg Ullman, and of course yeah. you worked with him. You got any uh, memories, of anything to, to say about him? Yes, I do, actually. Um, I, I met him one time, and, and I had become friendly with a guy, a guitar player, uh, called Johnny Vernazza. Johnny Vernazza, otherwise known as Johnny V., was the, was the second guitar player in Elvin Bishop's band great great band um this was around the time that they put out fooled around and fell in love okay mickey thomas was their lead singer at the time and they were they were fantastic they were playing at the whisking and uh i went to the show and johnny invited me on stage during the encore to, to sit in with them and it just happened that greg allman was also sitting in with them that night and I was just you know out of my mind so we uh, they you know none of them other other than my friend Johnny really knew who I was and uh, but you know I was a friend of Johnny's and he said you know I'd be okay and so on I was about 22 at the time so we played a few a few blues tunes and you know they pointed at me to take a solo on the first tune and so I played and I was playing Johnny V's, you know, 1957 Fender Strat, which is a really inspiring guitar to play. And I'm standing on stage between Elvin Bishop and Greg Allman on my right playing the organ. <laughs> and it, it, was like, it was like heaven. You know, I just, it was one of those times when, as a player, everything just fell into place and went, went just right. I, I, I felt really inspired. And plus, you know, I'd listened to all the Elvin Bishop records, all the Allman Brothers records. So, you know, I really knew that stuff. And it was just like, I don't know, like I said, it was like the planets lined up and, and everything I played that night was, was what I would have wanted to play. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and we finished the song and Greg Allman stood up and reached across the organ and shook my hand. And I thought, okay, this, this is it. I can, I can die now, you know, and I, this, this is all, all I ever wanted, you know. <laughs> oh, that's a wonderful story, and it's, yeah, you know, it's, it's a, it's a great memory. It's, it's sad we've lost him, you know, but uh, oh, absolutely, I, you know, far too young. Yeah, I was listening to Howard Stern talk about it, um, um, the other day on the radio, and, uh, and. Uh, it was one of those things that just kind of bypassed me because I don't really listen to the tabloids and whatnot. So yeah, good for you. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Um, uh, that stuff just kind of flies by me, and then I'm like one of the last people to know about it. Because I, I, I find with the media, a lot of stuff is just hokey and uh, you know total bull. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So anyway, um, yeah, you mentioned like you, you, gee, you like. The people that uh, you worked with, I mean, the Beach Boys, you got them. <laughs> well, I worked, I worked with members of the Beach Boys. Okay. I, I didn't actually work with the Beach Boys as a whole. And, uh, you know, I have actually friends that are on tour with, with Brian Wilson right now. Um, and, it, well, because I don't know if you know that much about the Beach Boys, but there's... There's there's a Mike Love Beach Boys band and then there's then there's a Brian Wilson band and you know it's one of those things where unfortunately they don't get along so um, it, it's it's a sad thing but anyway um, like I say the guys that I worked with like like Al Jardine who was an original Beach Boy and and David Marks who who Al actually replaced in the Beach Boys very early on I worked with both of them. Did you see the movie uh, based on Brian Wilson starring Paul Dano? I haven't. I haven't seen it yet. Oh, it was but terrific. Some of my friends worked on that as well. Oh, it was a I terrific it film. Yeah, it is. Fantastic. Um, and uh, uh, Paul Dano, I don't know how he sl slipped under the Academy Award when, uh, late, 
Raider from that one. Anyway, though, you've uh, also worked with Roger Daltrey. I, I, well, I wouldn't exactly call it I, – I appeared with Roger Daltrey, um, which is another funny story. Um, okay. An L.A. friend of mine, um, an agent named Harry Gold, um, who has you know, some terrific clients, Roger among them, and William Shatner, okay. um, invited, invited Roger – when I say invited, he, he sort of nudged, he, he coerced Roger to singing with his band at a local bar. Okay. And, you know, I was, I was kind of the ringer in the band because this was, you know, Harry's band. And these, it was made up of people who were his friends, his family, you know, childhood friends that he played music with. And they were all, you know, quite good. But I was, I was the one guy there that was a full-time musician. So anyway, uh, we had a little rehearsal, and Roger was supposed to come, and we we rehearsed and we rehearsed, and you know we're looking at the clock, and and you know we only have three hours in the studio, and Roger's not there, he's not there, and then he, I guess he'd gotten lost or whatever, and, and he got there, and you know he wasn't in a great mood, and and at, at first Harry said, oh I don't know if Roger's going to show up, and well finally he did, and he walked in and he looked, you know a little exasperated, and I said, so. Did you bring the beer? I said, and everybody looked at me. I said, well, you know, the new guy always has to bring the beer. So anyway, I think that broke the ice a little bit, and Roger turned out to be a real sweetheart, and and uh, we we went over some old R and B tunes, and uh, like um, you really got a hold of me, on me. You really got a hold on me, the Smokey Robinson song. That's, okay. that's what he wanted to sing. So we did that, and, and then before long, he picked up a guitar, and he was showing us who material on the guitar. It was just great. And then a few nights later, um, we did this gig, and, and we're there in this club, and then we get word that, oh, Roger's not coming. And Harry said, he's coming. And he sent his son-in-law, who was a very big guy, to Roger's house to pick him up and say, okay, you're getting in the car. You're going to the club now. So he dragged Roger to the club. Roger got up on stage. He sang these songs. He was fantastic. Um, <laughs> so it was it was a it was a great fun. And then, tragically, tragically, the next day, woke up, turned on the radio, and found out that John Entwistle had passed away. Okay. So uh, it was, a, in the end, you know, a bittersweet experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going mainly from uh, it's a lot of these names I read off Wikipedia, so I'm not sure what your collaborations are like with them, but I was pretty impressed with some of the names. Merle Haggart. Yes. <laughs> Merle Haggart was a guest on The Waltons. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we played on the show and, uh, and in between scenes. And he was just a wonderful guy. Yeah, and... Uh... <laughs> Michael McDonald. Now, when I think of Michael McDonald, I think of the forty-year-old virgin, where they just couldn't. St Paul, Paul Rubb was like, "Could you play anything other than Michael McDonald?" Oh, <laughs> did you see the forty-year-old virgin? I I didn't. Yeah, the, well, there of course the, the, the funny. It takes place in the store, of course, and one of the people working there is uh, Paul Rudd, and and um, Jane Lynch is the store manager, and he goes. Uh, you know, if I have to listen to uh, Michael McDonald one more time, yeah. <laughs> well, he's just he's just fantastic. I, I I I know where that's coming from. I think because at one point um, in the '80s, you couldn't turn on the radio without hearing him. I mean, he actually was kind of overexposed at 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 one point. I think because. The Doobie Brothers were a huge hit, and, and he had solo records out. Plus, he was making records with Christopher Cross and, and with Kenny Loggins, and you really couldn't turn on the radio without hearing him, which is, you know, can be dangerous for a, a career. Yeah. And, of course, uh, somebody that I knew of in the 80s, Richard Marks. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I toured with Richard Marks for a couple of years, and um, that was just great experience he he's fantastic 
you know, one of the one of the best songwriters and most consistent singers I've ever worked with. I mean, every single night his voice was great. What's he doing and, now? Well, the same thing, really. He he's still writing and producing and touring, um, touring on a more limited basis, I would say. But uh, yeah, he's still out there. I think he just released um, a new single a few days ago. You know, it's interesting because I, I remember in the 80s when he was really big. Back, back in April, I had the pleasure of interviewing Tiffany. Oh, and, really? Oh, yeah, I, like because I, it's the 30th anniversary of her debut album, and I had her posters all over my bedroom wall at that okay. time. And and I reached out, and I was like, you know, I think I wanted to see if I could get her on the show, and I, I couldn't believe it uh, when I got her on the phone. And... Uh, and I had an interview with her, and uh, all these memories of her music and the videos, and her in the shopping right. malls and, right, and right, stuff yeah. like that, you know. And uh, and I remember, of course, Richard Marks was one of those uh, performers that uh, was popular at that time as well. Yeah, that was right at the same time. And, um, you know, I started playing with Richard just as his first album came out, and it was really it was really fascinating to to be involved with his his career at a time when it was just just starting to take off you know just as the first single came out and we went on the road and and you know went from playing clubs to playing theaters and arenas as as an opening act for REO Speedwagon and other people and then him going on to be a headliner and having number one records and and it was it was such a a great learning experience for me, and it's something that you know I'd wanted to do ever since I was a kid. And of course, my um, my musical goals kind of got sidetracked in a way by the Waltons, which I was involved in from you know 15 to 25. That was my day job, so to speak, and took up most of my time, so that. Um, you know, I was I was playing music and I was writing songs all the time, and I would do some some gigs here and there, and and do like weekend appearances in different places. But I but I could never do it full time. And um, you know, a friend at the time referred to music as as the the jealous mistress in my life, which is funny. But but that's kind of how it was. You know, I was just just itching to do music full time, and of course that's what I did when the show ended but um yeah the experience with richard was just just amazing and it made me realize that when someone gets a record deal and they and they put their first album out that's when the work really starts cuz he worked so hard i mean we would we would travel by bus and we would check into these hotels and and you know the band would sleep in the next day but at nine o'clock in the morning he was at some radio station doing an interview okay. and then he would do an in store promo and he'd be signing albums in the in the record store and you know I mean he he'd do a few of those during the day and then you know when we'd be getting up and going to sound check that was like you know he'd already had done a whole list of things by then so. That was kind of a, a revelation for me as to just how much work it is to um, to start and, and maintain that kind of career. You know, it's interesting. What do you think today? Like, like when I was I was born in 1972, and of course it was mm -hmm. my parents still have an eight track player, and then of course right. went to vinyl. Sure. Vinyls made a comeback. I mean, um, it's, it's amazing because I remember yeah. vinyl way back in the day, you know, back in the 70s right. and 80s. Now it's sure. back again. Well, I think, you know, there's, there's kind of a, a nostalgic aspect oh, to it. Yeah. But also, also people who are real audiophiles, who are really into sound and really into equipment, and they have, you know, really fine turntables and, and speakers, prefer the sound of vinyl to to digital recordings. Oh yes, absolutely. There's definitely a different. I still I've got some vinyl home as well. But um, yeah, I remember like some, even some of the 
the movies I've seen in the last five years even bring that back. Rock of Ages did a really good job at uh, showcasing uh, <laughs> some vinyl in one particular scene in, in, in the movies. With that said, you know, I, I was wondering, you know, I have you worked any, like especially with uh, music involved in any motion pictures? Um, because I know you did it with television, but right, mostly, mostly television. Okay. Um, soundtracks. I did quite a lot of that. Um, I have a, a good old friend in L.A., Dan Folliard, who was a TV composer, and and he would hire me frequently to play on sessions, and um, you know that was that was great fun, and I, I got to meet some incredible musicians that way yeah well i know i know for example you know i know the waltons was a major thing with you and uh and uh it seems like uh you've been with that show like forever even with the uh, tv movies that came along with it do you got right. any any uh interesting stories to, to pop up uh about your experiences on the waltons like anything unusual or interesting well you know it's um the, the first thing I think that's kind of unusual is that we are all still in touch. Okay. You know, we're, we're all in contact. Um, you know, back in the day, we just, we hit it off immediately and really became like a family, which I think contributed to the success of the show. And, uh, I mean, we just had our, our 45th reunion, fan club reunion in Virginia, where the show is based. Okay. And we had a, a huge crowd of people outside who who some of them stood in in the sun for six hours to get in and and get autographs it was remarkable and 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 the the people were in such good humor i was so impressed i mean i i couldn't have done it i couldn't i mean if the beatles had been in there i couldn't have stood in, in the sun for six hours did every one of you show up um pretty much yeah <laughs> yeah all the all the living cast members uh, I sorry, except for Richard Thomas. Richard Thomas um, is in a play on Broadway for which he is nominated for a Tony, and he was unable to make it. Oh, <laughs> well. I also like notice, of course, you did a lot of um, work, of course, with the animated, of course, Winnie the Pooh as well. Right. <laughs> the only cartoon I can think of that uh, has a tiger that bounces up and down on its ass. And does know right, what he right, is. Right. <laughs> Paul Winchell as Tigger. <laughs> yeah, he was fantastic. You know, Paul Winchell invented one of the first artificial hearts. Oh, I didn't know that. Yep. Yeah. yeah. In addition to being Tigger and being a tremendous ventriloquist and a kid show host, he invented an artificial heart. Quite amazing. Well, aside from the Waltons and... Uh... And uh, Winnie the Pooh, tell me about some of the other, like, uh, I know you got a whole list of credits of television that that uh, you worked on for me, me to go up over. So so um, tell me about some of the shows that you worked in that, uh, like some some of the, the, what are my words I'm looking for? I was going to say best experience, but, but I'm speaking from the particular shows. Like, what shows did you enjoy working on best? Uh, you know they were they were all interesting and 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 fun. I mean, I I was very lucky that I had I had very good experiences as a child actor. You know, I, I did Combat, Daniel Boone, Nanny and the Professor, My Three Sons. Um, you know, I did a few commercials. I I did the voice of Christopher Robin. I did a film at Disney called The One and Only Genuine Original Family Band with Walter Brennan and Buddy Ebsen, Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn. Um, oh, I love Goldie Hawn. I just saw her in Snatch, and I just saw Kurt Russell in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Right. It, what an and, unusual and this, couple, huh? Yeah, great couple. Now, what's this movie called again? It was called The One and Only Genuine Original Family Band. It was a musical, and <laughs> it was the music was written by the Sherman Brothers, who wrote the music to Mary Poppins. Okay. And this was uh, about four years after Mary Poppins. It came out in 68. Okay. And it was actually when Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn met. 
Oh, okay. And, you know, um, he was 16. She she was a few years older, still, you know, very young. And, um, gosh, you know, they were they were both just terrific. She uh, she had not really, I mean, this was prior to Laugh-In and, and her big film role. She had a very small part in this, um, just, you know, a couple of lines, and she was a dancer. She was, she was an unbelievable dancer. And I can't, to my knowledge... Um, she never made a feature film after that where she really danced. No. And I, she she was an unbelievable dancer. I mean, she was doing these these high kicks in that film where you know her 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 foot is above her head. And I always thought, gosh, you know, why doesn't she do something that involves dancing? You know, but there you go. Did you just do music in, in this, or did you act in this? In the film? Yeah. Oh gosh, I you know I I I had an acting role. Um, I was uh, eleven at the time. This was actually my my second job as an actor. But the but the film is um, like I say, it's a musical, and it's about um, a real life musical family who lived in Dakota in the eighteen hundreds. Okay. You know, it's weird because I didn't see this listed in your credits, um, unless I missed something, because uh, th- this just didn't catch my attention. Right. And you say it's... Walter Brennan and Buddy Ebsen's in that, huh? Right. What right. were they like to work with? Oh, just fantastic. Yeah, Buddy Ebsen was, was just the nicest man you could imagine. And then later I worked with his, his good friend, Fess Parker, on okay. a Daniel Boone episode. So and so we kind of hit it off because I was able to say, hey, you know, I worked, I just worked with Buddy Ebsen, and they were, you know, co-stars in Davy Crockett together. Okay, I always felt bad for Buddy because I know that one of his biggest career losses was he was supposed to play the Tin Man in in The Wizard of Oz, and and right. the makeup, uh, he had some kind of reaction to the makeup, right. and uh, he wasn't able to do it, and Jack Haley was brought in. Right. And uh, yeah, that would have been a huge thing in his career had he yeah. done that. Not that he, not that he wasn't successful. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, he had a wonderful film career. Um, you know, those early movies where he's tap dancing, and then um, he was in Breakfast at Tiffany's. Uh, I love that with film. Audrey Hepburn. Yep. And um, and then you know the Beverly Hillbillies and. Um, and then I just going out of my head now. What's what was the police show? Oh, Barnaby Jones. Yeah. The police show. So he was a guy that I mean he worked right up till the end. And what a lovely guy he was. Just a you know fantastic sweet human being. He he played guitar as well. And uh, you know on the set of the film we used to sit around and and talk guitar and and play guitar. It was just you know he's a very down to earth fellow. Yeah, wow. So, uh, yeah, uh, other than that, is, uh, what other uh, roles have you, that come to mind? I know you worked on uh, an early version of The Cosby Show. Right, right, which was um, also great fun. I mean, this was um, 1969. Yeah, I noticed. Um, I didn't know it was the back first, then. <laughs> the first Bill Cosby sitcom, not the you know the later 80s one where he had the family, in this one, um, he played a basketball coach, and okay. I think it only ran a couple of seasons. And I had a role playing a, a stuck-up child actor, um, and, and Bill Cosby, as as he, he played a basketball coach, as I say, um, gets cast in a TV commercial, and I, and I was the co-star of the TV commercial, and you know, kind of trying to give him acting pointers. So uh, and he was great. He was great to me. I mean, I, I, I adored Bill Cosby. I loved his records and his TV stuff. And, you know, later I saw him, um, gosh, I think it was in, in Las Vegas in his nightclub act. He's a tremendously talented man. And it's, I have to say it's, it's very sad, the things that, you know, have, have come out about him. Um, yes. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really look good for him at this point. 
Yeah, that that's another thing too. Why I say I hate the the media and the tabloids. It's like we just had this situation come up uh, recently about Kathy Griffin and uh, holding up the the Donald Trump severed head thing. You know, and, right, right. You know, and the media goes all nuts. I try to tune that stuff out as best I can. Of course, I listen to it on Howard Stern because Howard Stern knows how, to, knows how to spin it around in an entertaining fashion. But right. I find it's almost like when you're in grade school and uh, there's always that one kid being bullied and everybody else has to get in on it. But if yeah. it was them, they wouldn't like it, you know? Right, right. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. And, I, you know, I understand, I, I understand both sides of that story. Um, you know, I can see where it would offend people and people would say it was in bad taste. And, oh, and, and it certainly I, I was, certainly, yeah. Pardon me? I cert- I agree. It was in bad taste, yeah. Yeah. I, I, on the other hand, um, you know, it wasn't – it was meant to be humor. Um, and, and But there's there's that whole, you know, freedom of, of speech, freedom yeah. of expression aspect. It doesn't – it didn't actually hurt anybody. I mean, one one might consider that sort of thing to be an artistic – expression so you know while i i agree i mean you know it's not in great taste but but I, you know i try to respect people's right of of of, of speech and and expression so sure, i think um, yeah. we have to be we have to be careful what we you know forbid people to do you know what i agree with you 100 percent there because I, I i'm gonna tell you um I, i'm not a big fan of censorship and I, yeah. I, I understand why I exist, and I agree that, that you, there has to be some per- precautions, but I can't stand, especially where, like, I review movies as, as well, and uh, I can't stand groups like Movie Guide or whatnot that want to bring the Hays Code back right. so that all, all scripts uh, have to go through them and all R-rated material have to be stripped from movies, and I'm like, right. Who gives these people the right to tell me what I can and cannot watch on my right. television? Right, exactly. <laughs> because they they can't seem to turn it off, and they're afraid their children will see it. Well, isn't that right. their fault? <laughs> right, right. I, I, well, you know, I I think these days there are a lot of things that are on the news that, you know, events that happen, things that people say, you know, on camera that um, – you know, are are real and are a lot more dangerous for kids to hear than things that are in films. I'll tell you something I found out recently. I guess there was this thing that came out where I think it's I think it's Sony Pictures. Don't quote me on that. They're taking a bunch of movies that uh, and they're um, releasing versions of them that are are, are edited or yeah. are more susceptible to. Uh, uh, a younger audience, and of course, um, Seth, Seth Rogen, rightfully so, is is opposed to this. And I would imagine yeah. Woody Allen and Mel Brooks will be opposed to it as well. Sure, and I'm I'm opposed to it. It's yeah, like I am too. Yeah, and of course, now I come from a Christian family, but I can't stand these groups out there that decide. Gee, let's decide what everybody should watch because right. I, right. you know. And I, I get really tired of people and their censorship. So it's like, yes, yeah, like a yeah. I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I think it's 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 a good thing that we have ratings. Mm-hmm. So you know, parents know what they have an idea what's going to be in a movie before they go. They can decide whether or not their kids should see it. You know, that's legit. That's fine. Um, and you know, the, the I think the best argument is if if you don't like something, you you don't have to watch it exactly yeah and of course you coming up in music of course you've seen that same argument with music as well you know right (laughs) these people protesting uh these so-called evil bands you know and i I remember here's a funny story i I love pat benatar and she had a song called hell is for children 
Sure. And it was a song about child abuse. Right. And uh, she took so much slack over that song because of the word hell is for children. Right. And and uh, even her husband, who does guitar on, and her band, right. said, you know, do they not know how to read? I mean, the lyrics clearly slate, state, state, excuse me, state that it's about child abuse. What's yeah. wrong with these people? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there was a big flack about Randy Newman's song, Short People. <laughs> okay. Right? And Randy Newman is, is a terrific songwriter. He's a great musician. He's a great lyricist. Mm-hmm. But, but so many of his songs are tongue-in-cheek. Okay. And Short People was a song against prejudice and, and, and trying to explain how ridiculous prejudice is. And so his way of doing that was to say, you know, short people got no reason to live. That was the lyric, right? Which is utterly ridiculous. But, but that was to make the point. And I guess a lot of people missed the point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell me, uh, is, um, what, what's coming up? for you in the future like what what are you working on now well i just yesterday put out my first solo cd okay which is a blues cd all right and uh it's six covers uh six original songs the covers are songs that i grew up listening to loving Mm -hmm. um and then the originals in in the blues style um, that was always music that, uh, that really moved me. And okay. as a kid, you know, loving rock and roll, I didn't, I didn't realize right away that, that, that what I loved about it, what I loved most about it, was the bluesy element, you know, the rawness of it, the emotion of it, the rhythm of it. And um, I started playing guitar at eight, and at about 13, um, you know, I was trying to be a what they called a lead guitarist in those days. And somewhere I read a sentence that said, the best lead guitarists, B.B. King and Eric Clapton, dot, 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 dot. I thought, okay, I got to find out who these guys are. So I did, and obviously B.B. King is one of the greatest blues guitar players, as is Eric Clapton of all time. And that just opened a whole new world of music for me. And later, as I became a, a professional musician, that, that influence stayed with me. And I tried to bring that feeling and emotion to my playing in, in whatever kind of you know, musical situation I was playing in, whatever, whatever gig I was hired to do. I tried to incorporate that, that feeling in the way I played. So, um, as I say, you know, I've... I, kind of had a long career as a, as a musician playing with other people, doing all kinds of music, all kinds of gigs. And uh, when my wife and I decided to move to the East Coast, I decided that uh, career-wise I was going to concentrate on my own stuff and, uh, and, and do the kind of music that I love the most, that, uh, that represents me best. And um, that's the blues. How long did it take you to write this album? Pardon me? How long did it take you to write this album? Um, not long. I mean, because I, I, I composed um, a half dozen tunes for it. Two of, the, two of mine are, are instrumentals and, um, and four vocals. And uh, it, it came rather quickly, which is, which is a good you know, indication that the, that the music and the style was a good fit for me. Because I, I, I find when one tries to do something that is not natural to them it it doesn't come easily no. and this just flowed out so uh i'm i'm very happy with it i i decided to try well first of all i recorded um uh, i played all the instruments myself okay um and did the recording and the and the mixing and um i decided that that what i wanted to go for was was kind of that raw blues sound um, you know, on the old records, they didn't have computers, they didn't have synthesizers, they didn't have pitch correction and samples and all that stuff. And so I decided to just kind of go for it and, and do something that was raw and sounded like like a bunch of guys just sitting around in a room jamming away. So that's what I did, and I, and I think that energy comes across in the music. 
Wow. And you you got uh, a web page where people can check this out on? Yes, absolutely. It's it's called johnwamsleymusic.com. Okay. And that's and that's actually the the only place that the CD uh, or the download is available. Um, I opted not to do all the usual platforms and uh, streaming and all that because, frankly, um, and you know, you may have read about this. Uh, musicians don't make a lot of money from that, from streaming and so on. So I thought I'm just going to put it out in this limited way and uh, hope that I can kind of personally reach out to my fans and and um, that they'll enjoy it. Oh, absolutely. So you, and are you done acting? Like, do you do any more acting anymore? I haven't for a while, uh, but which is not to say that I wouldn't do it again. But uh, music has always been my my first love, and uh, and what I've concentrated on always. Um, but you know, who knows? If, if someone offered me a, um, a little role in something, I'd, I'd be I'd be interested. But um, you know, as much as I enjoyed the the acting itself, um, you know, the 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 business part of television of, of acting um, didn't really appeal to me that much. Not not that the music business is a piece of cake either, but I find at least with music, I mean, I can I can stay home and play guitar and and get enjoyment and fulfillment. Yep out of that whereas you know it's it's hard to act in a room by yourself well here's my last question out of all the musical acts you've worked with and we've talked about a lot of them here yeah which one is the like i know you liked all of them but which one stands out as your most memorable oh gosh most memorable musical act that you worked oh. with you know, I, I, <laughs> boy, that's 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 really it's really tough. I, I'd have to say it was maybe um, between working with Merle Haggard um, or jamming with Greg Allman, both completely different experiences, but but just incredibly memorable to me in in terms of um, who they were and 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 how how great they were. Um, I mean, it doesn't. It really doesn't get any better than that. What about acting wise? Uh, anybody that you worked with that just uh, stood out? Well, I have to say that um, the actors on the Waltons are as great as they come. You know, Ralph Waite, Michael Learned, Will Gear, Ellen Corby, Richard Thomas. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it really it doesn't get better than that. And, and also, we had. We had guests and, and semi regulars on the show like John Ritter okay. and um you know, Beulah Bondi, um I mean uh, Sissy Spacek. I love Sissy. There really were some unbelievable Dean Dean Jagger, who was, you know, an Academy Award winner. I there was an episode where um the, the episode kind of focused on, on on he and I. That those were un unbelievable. Um, is it true? Well. I I I I'm not sure if I got this right, but was Jennifer Jason Lee a guest on the Waltons? Yes. Okay. Yes, she played. Um, she played uh, Jim Bob's girlfriend, and I had worked with her dad, Vic Morrow, yeah. in my my first ever TV job. Okay. I'm not even sure I told her that, but. Oh, I like Jennifer. Always like Jennifer. Oh yeah. Yeah. And finally, she got an Academy Award nomination a couple of years ago. Boat time. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah, long overdue. Well, is there anything before we close off that you want to plug or promote? Well, just like I say, the, the CD, which is called uh, Going to Clarksdale. Okay. Uh, is my, my latest project. And, uh, you know, there'll be – it was a great, great experience. I hope, I hope my – fans uh my walton's fans and and new fans will enjoy it and um and i expect there'll be more in the future and of course i uh, throw out that uh, uh web page name again it's johnwamsleymusic.com 
Absolutely. And, of course, you've got a Facebook fan page as well, right? Right, right. John Walmsley Fan. Okay. So people can uh, check out your music. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, and yes, feel free to send me some uh, MP3s, and I'll incorporate them here on the show. And uh, and uh, if I can, I don't know how to do it, but <laughs> get my brother, my younger brother, to uh, maybe fit them in here on the the tail end of the interview. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, do. You know, if just, he knows uh, how to do that. <laughs> yeah, I'll just I'll just send them to your email. Sure, you send them to me, and uh, yeah, get them a little bit of airplay. Wonderful. I appreciate it. No problem. Before you go, could I get you to do a plug for my show? Hey there. This is John Walmsley, and you are listening to Python's Paradise with Greg Gilbert out of New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. You mean Canada. <laughs> Sorry? New Brunswick, Canada. I'm <laughs> not in Nova Scotia. <laughs> I thought I thought uh, New Brunswick was Nova Scotia. No, but we're right next door. We're both a four-hour drive from Nova Scotia. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, no big deal. Okay. Well, take two, Greg. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Hey there. This is John Walmsley, and you're listening to Python's Paradise with Greg Gilbert out of New Brunswick, Canada. You, uh, you're, you're right now residing in Maine, right? Yes, that's right. Did you ever, you ever run into uh, Stephen King? Um, n- not really. It, I, we've, we've been to his house. His house is actually on the tourist maps. Okay. So, you know, if you, if you have your GPS out and you, uh, you know, your GPS map and you're in Bangor, and you know you write Stephen King on the search; it'll it'll drop a pin where his house is. I mean that's how that's how well known it is. He he used to host a Halloween party and have invite people in to you know kind of mill around his house on Halloween. His he has a wrought iron gate in the front, uh, wrought iron fence that is all like spiders and snakes and stuff like that. It's it's fantastic.